First of all, I just want to thank you very much for taking part in this webinar on editorial and visual effects and the hybrid and combination of those two disciplines. When did you begin your career as an editor? Well, um, I actually started as an assistant editor, and I was an assistant editor for about 12 years before I actually started you know, actually editing. I worked on a lot of Rob Reiner movies for Cast Rock Entertainment, and I had was very fortunate in that um, I had an editor who was he was a mentor to me. So I started out in the film world before nonlinear and digital um, tools became ubiquitous. And in fact, when I started, there really nobody was using computers to edit. Um, but I was always very interested in digital technology as a kid. I um, I remember seeing one of the very first Apple computers. Uh, my high school, my, actually my junior high school teacher had one and brought it into class, and I thought, wow, you can play games with that. That's going to be awesome. So I really started following, you know, computers and digital technology as much as I could at a, a very early age. So when it came time to make the, the leap from film to avid nonlinear, um, I was uniquely prepared. I, I, I was actually one of the few people in Hollywood that I know who's that. I didn't see it as a detriment. I, I was very excited about it. Um, and fortunately for me, the editor that I worked with, he knew nothing about computers, and so he relied on me a great deal to um, bring him along into the digital age. And that helped me progress quite a bit as both an assistant and as an editor. And one of the things that I learned during that period, I mean, that we're talking, this is this is uh, late 80s, early 90s, you know, like 90, I think 89, 90, something like that, when we started looking at nonlinear tools. I'm terrible with dates, so if anybody looks it up, it's going to, you know, I, I reserve the right to be off by a year or two. Basically, you know, while everybody in the film industry was sort of deriding this idea that, oh, my God, you know, now that everyone's going to start cutting on Avid or Lightworks or whatever it is, it's going to it's going to change the way we do, you know, make film. You have to, you know, you never really look at stuff, and and it's all too fast, and our jobs are changing. And while everybody was freaking out, I was like, wow, this is great. For the first time, I can actually edit as much as I want without destroying anything. And um, so I started learning, and I, I really sort of applied myself to all the different tools and that led from from nonlinear editing I started getting more and more individual effects doing temp effects as as an assistant editor to help jobs and then I started you know I realized pretty early on that in order to make it I was gonna have to distinguish myself I was gonna have to add value to to my capabilities because um, at the end of the day I've always sort of looked at it as a craft and it's you know, it's clearly it's not for everyone. It takes a lot of patience. It takes a lot of time. It's not something you just wake up and you're like, oh, I'm a great editor. It takes time to actually get good at it. There are other aspects to it that you can either ignore or you can embrace. And what I'm talking about is, you know, when you don't have certain performances. You know, there are a lot of different tricks and techniques that editors use. You know, the easiest one to describe would be slipping audio, for instance, you know where we'll take a line from one reading and throw it into another reading. If you take that a little bit further, why not slip facial features? Why not, you know, cut somebody out of one side and, and, and replace them with another uh, performance? If you have a single, like a two shot, you know, you can do a split screen. You might want to take it even further, do a split screen and do a morph from, from one cut to another on, on just one character, or one subject. So these are things that I started thinking about and I realized in order to be able to do them as an editor, I needed to be fast and I needed to be good because you don't always have a lot of time in the cutting room. So when I was an assistant and I became an editor, I went from doing huge budget movies to really small movies that, you know, very few people would see mm -hmm. with very small budgets. And so I was, you know, I was paying my mortgage and uh, doing quite well as the first assistant editor. Then all of a sudden, there was more money in the in the budget for the Avid rental than there was for me as an editor. So I kind of leveraged my abilities as a visual effects compositor and an editor and said, you know what, this little $3 million movie, they've got $80,000 in the budget for what they're calling opticals, mm -hmm. and what I'm going to call visual effects. You give me that money, I'll do all those effects, I'll do them while we're editing, and 
you'll be happy. I'll, you know, I'll be able to pay my mortgage and I'll be able to continue as an editor. So um, that's kind of how I sort of made my jump into editing as I just decided that by increasing my capabilities, I would be able to leverage those capabilities to make myself more valuable to the people who, who might want to hire me. So in terms of discovering fusion, or, or you know, you discovered obviously working in opticals, probably at the beginning working on Avid, I guess, and just dealing with their layer environments for visual effects and maybe some other layer-based visual effects compositing uh, programs. When did you discover fusion? Give us a little bit of a scenario. On... I'm actually sort of a late fusion bloomer. So I, I discovered it quite a while ago, but I didn't really start using it um, heavily until um, The Amazing Spider-Man. So before that, I actually bought a copy of Fusion, um, I want to say around 2007, maybe 2008, sometime after I, I did the movie Little Manhattan. Um, I was at NAB, and uh, you know I've been pretty much using a lot of uh, Autodesk products, mm -hmm. and I've been burned by Autodesk a number of times. Not, I, I really liked combustion a great deal, and that was kind of my tool of choice for a long time. It actually was really useful at, at a time. Now it's not so useful. Mm -hmm. um, and then I moved into Toxic, and I was very happy with Toxic as it was progressing, and then they kind of clamped that out. And then I started realizing that, um, so this is basically right around Toxic came on screen. I was at NAB, and I was looking at all the different compositors that were available. And I saw Fusion, and I thought, wow, Fusion's really, this looks really good. This looks like it has everything that I, that I want. So I purchased a copy of it, and I brought it back to my shop. At that time, I had a small shop. Um, I was doing visual effects in between films and for small independent films for friends of mine. So I, I would have anywhere from one to, to five employees at a time. And I brought it back to the shop and uh, decided I would start to get people trained up on it. And the people at Ion were really helpful in allowing me to get a, a copy at a reasonable price so we could, you know, get my employees trained on fusion and we did a few we did some we did some a few shows uh, uh, one of my compositors a guy named Randy Little did um, a, an enormous number of shots for the movie bug a Billy Friedkin movie using fusion but I didn't really use it much because I was off actually editing and you know when you're editing and you're in the thick of it you grab the tool you know and you just get the stuff done um, I'm not a big fan of Avid's actual their visual effects workflow. I, there's too much nesting. It's very, very hard. It, it's easy to do this stuff. It's very hard to go back and figure out what you did a month later. You know, it, you just have to completely break the whole thing and, and when you try to do something else that sometimes breaks. So I very rarely do anything other than like a basic push in or blow up or dissolve with any of the Avid tools. I'm always going off to a secondary program. So on The Amazing Spider-Man, uh, that was a show that was shot in stereo, so we had left and right eye, and I was on an earlier version of Avid. The new version 6.0 supports stereo in a very good way. Uh, version 5, unfortunately, it supports it, but you can't even do a basic blow-ups without a, a huge offset and stuff. So I was basically I was going, well, I could go with Nuke, or I can use this tool that I already own. And from what I read online, uh, Fusion supported stereo in a, in a really nice, simple way. And this is even before Dimension came on the scene. So I upgraded my version of Fusion, which at that time was version 5. I upgraded it to 6. And I just put it to work. And I, little by little, I kind of worked my way into it. I would basically, you know, okay, I'm going to do a split screen. And then I get on the forums. I go, hey, guys, I'm having trouble with this or that. And, and a lot of the issues that I had were really just, you know, learning um, kinks, just me sort of understanding the quirks of the tool. Um, by the end of the show, I was super rapid with Fusion. And I, I ended up, you know, on a movie like Spider-Man, when you're the editor, you're not able to do a tremendous amount of final compositing. It's just not, there's just no time for it. Um, but I, I literally did hundreds of temp shots using Fusion, and I ended up doing five actual final shots in Fusion uh, for the movie. Sony Imageworks did all the all the visual effects, and then a couple other companies, Blur, did the main titles and, and one of the key sequences in the movie. Um, 
I'm not sure, but I think Blur is a fusion house. Um, and then we brought in another compositor who was sort of our um, emergency compositor, compositor, a guy named um, Arthur Mesa, who is from um, Flash Filmworks. And he was using fusion. It was great to actually have him around doing emergency comps. And he did a bunch of, a bunch of shots sort of like last minute because we had so much stuff that we were doing so rapidly towards the finishing and ending of this movie, you know, just things that would fall through the cracks, like, oh, my God, we have to do this, we have to do that. Or, um, and I brought in Arthur. He sat down, and he did everything we could throw at him. And he, he was very well-versed in stereo as well. Basically, you know, at the beginning of Spider-Man, I started using um, combustion, and then I started, like, weaving fusion into it because I really, the node-based compositing is super powerful it's it's very easy to go back and see what you're doing and the stereo aspects you know to be able to split stereo streams and then recombine them was really useful um and i love the way that you know the transforms concatenate and just the it, just the whole way the program works really lended itself to that process um of course you know it was a little bit of a pain and this is why i think connection is going to be really cool is whenever I wanted to do a shot, I would have, you know, maybe two or three Avid layers, and I'd have to mark it in, mark it out, and then export each layer separately as a, you know, an image sequence. And because I was working on a Mac version of Avid, um, I would export that off onto my Windows box, which would sit next to me. Um, but, you know, it just basically sort of stops the flow a little bit. You're like, okay, I'm ready to get going. And then it's like, oh, no, I have to do my in, my out. I've got to export that one. i got to name it properly. got to export this layer. got to export that layer. Then once it's exported, you got to go to the other machine. you got to go through it all. Okay, bring your loaders in, line everything up, do your work. Then you got to render it out, then import that back into the Avid. So that, that process, you know, there was a lot of housekeeping involved. And you know, what you really want when you're really moving is you're, you're going from editing, oh, I need to do this. You hit a button, get a cup of coffee if you need to. Don't worry about setting your ins and out marks. And then sit down at the other system, get your work done, hit render, and go back to editing. And when that render's done, have it pop up in your timeline, um, which is what we're getting now with Connection. And I can't, I can't tell you how excited I am about where that tool is going because I plan to use it on my next movie um, for pretty much all my temp effects. And I don't know, you know, who's going to be doing all the final shots, whether they're going to be using the tool, but I can tell you that I personally and my assistants, hopefully, will be using Fusion on, in our day-to-day -day, uh, work. It'll be part of our permanent tool set um, in conjunction with the Avid. In terms of your knowledge base of advanced visual effects, because you obviously have a lot more than an A over B understanding of visual effects you because fusion's ability to branch in different directions and combine at the end um how important is that knowledge base as an editor um let's say you're, you're working on a visual effects film or a film that is not visual effect based but you have to use visual effects to you know to hide uh, imperfections and uh, areas like that we, we live in a world where everybody's um roles kind of intersect and, and you know it's a very collaborative industry so to be able to speak the same language as the visual effects supervisor to understand why they're doing certain things um, to be able to collaborate with them and for them to be able to collaborate with you I mean on the amazing spider-man the visual effects supervisor's office was right behind mine and he and I would get together pretty much almost daily and talk about various scenes and sequences and he had creative input and I had creative input. And a lot of, of an editor's job is managing the whole project. It's not just telling the story, but it's actually understanding how certain um, things impact other things. So, you know, a really common thing is you start a movie, they finish shooting, and right off the bat, um, you've got these, these pesky effects people coming in going, you gotta turn over sequences so we can get the shots done. Well, if you don't really have an understanding of what that means and the types of sequences and the types of technology needed to achieve some of the goals in those sequences, you, it might suddenly be overwhelming. You might suddenly think, oh, my God, I have to 
finish the movie so these people can get everything they want. And I've heard a lot of editors sort of complain about effects turnovers because they really do kind of, you know, hinder your ability to edit. It, it, it's a big meeting. You've got to sort of lock picture. And when you start to understand what what the visual effects supervisor is actually asking for, what they're doing, there are ways that you can help. Um, and there are ways that you can that you can actually contribute that are helpful to the movie. So, you know, for instance, generally they're, they're not asking for the, the smaller pieces. They want the big character things. They want the things with the huge set extensions. And, you know, if you, if you can look at certain sections and go, well, wait a minute, you guys only need like 25%. You know, you need to get the set extension built. You need to get these things built. You need to get this sort of stuff. Once you start to understand what the process is, you can start breaking it down, which is really what editing is about. It's like taking things and breaking them down into little small baby steps. So there's that. That's an added benefit. Then the other added benefit, which is really something that I think um, is valuable for editors and certainly has been valuable for me and the directors I work for, is you start to t you start to look at footage differently. Um, so. You know, as an editor, a lot of what we do is we go through and we're trying to find performances. We're trying to connect people um, and make the scene work. And, you know, the first thing you do is you go through and you cut it and you use just the editing tool at your disposal to try to make the scene work as best as possible to get that performance. But sometimes as you get later on in the film, and once you look at the film as a whole, you realize that, that a scene might not be doing what it needs to do. And sometimes you can do things that are actually quite drastic. You know, you might completely erase one character from the scene and turn a scene into something completely different. And if you don't understand how the tools work and have the ability to generate some of that in a, at least in attempt form, it can be very daunting to actually get that to work. I mean, you know, uh, I do that not all the time, but certainly on every movie there's something tricky like that where you're like, okay, this scene is not working as intended. We're either going to cut it out of the movie, or maybe we can we can look at it differently and change it in a fundamental way so that it actually lifts up another scene or, or propels the story in a way that we hadn't thought of when we were shooting the movie. And having the visual effects background and the ability to actually do that work right then and there, you know, be able to say to the director, look, I think this will work. You leave come back in, in four hours and I'll have this scene in a way that you, you never imagined is incredibly powerful. And I, I can't really talk about the specific scenes that we did that on The Amazing Spider-Man, but I can tell you that this type of thinking went into some key sequences in the movie and were incredibly valuable. And fusion connection would have been great, but fusion itself allowed me to do some stuff that I never could have done just straight on the app and had it look as good as it did. I mean, we were previewing things, um, you know, for for audiences that were temp effects that I actually did in the box, right in the editing bay. You know, hundreds of people were watching it. The heads of the studio, they looked at it and thought, oh, my God, how did you do this? And for an editor to be able to do that and have, you know, studio executives recognize it, holy smokes, that's an incredibly powerful tool. That leads me into nodes versus layers. Fusion nodes, and then there's, you know, there's other, it's not just Avid layers, but After Effects layers, which I'm sure you've worked in. <clears throat> yeah, I have. There. Combustion, of course, had its layers environment. I'd love to hear your description on the freedom of working in a node, in, you know, specifically in Fusion node environment. Well, nodes versus layers. I mean, layers are great for editing. I and mean, that's basically it. Layers are great for editing. They're great for doing Photoshop things. They're great for painting. They're great for editing. They're not very good for compositing. Um, you know, it's a lot of editors go towards After Effects tools because they're layered based. Layered based compositors are very, very weak. You're going to do a lot of work and you're going to do a lot of work around to get through. Remember, layers, you got to think of them as curtains. Okay? And that's what they are. They're curtains. And when you've got something that's three curtains deep and you want to bring it up here, you've got a whole bunch of schmutzky you've got to get through. In a node-based world, it's all there. You can see it very easily. You, you can look at a node. Here's, here's the best way to describe it. Is in a layer-based universe, 
You can get work done. There's no doubt about it. But a month later, when you have no idea what you did to achieve that, that stunning visual effect or that invisible visual effect, and you go back to that layer, you've got all these different effects nested in all sorts of different layers. It's, it will take you literally hours to figure out what it is that you did. And if you want to recreate that on another comp, it's very hard to just take this chunk of whatever creative energy that you put time and energy into and pull it out and add it to something else. In a node-based environment, um, that's extremely easy. And it's very easy to look at. You know, One of the things that's great about nodes is not only can you look at your own work, but you can look at other people's work and you can see exactly where all the information is flowing, where all the visual, what, what each piece is doing to the other piece. And it's very easy to pull sections and isolate things and work in a really creative way. Now, it's not easy for editors to understand the node-based thing because we're always thinking, we're trained to think in terms of cuts and layers. We're trained to think oh, if this is on top of this, then that's what I'm going to see. Um, you just need to wrap your head around it. And once you do, if you take the hour or two hours it takes to get into node-based compositing, you will never go back. I mean, it, it, it is very hard. I started out um, with Photoshop and After Effects, and then I went into Combustion, which was sort of a quasi-layer node-based tool. And as I got more into using nodes, I started to realize just how powerful they were. Now I'm at a point where... You know, I'm looking at, at, at After Effects and my eyes glaze over. It is almost impossible to look at an After Effects timeline and understand what's happening without twirling down every single thing. It takes hours. I can look at a Fusion node graph. I can look at the workspace, and I can tell you within minutes what's happening. It's very simple. Question about... Effect shots versus non-effect shots, and I find a lot of editors, myself included, always find, you know, what's tougher for you, to hide imperfections or to create, one's more of a creative process, one's more of a creative solution, whether it be things like set extensions, which is more of a, we want it to look seamless versus something to a look effecty, if you will. I'd love to hear some of your thoughts. I just saw uh, Wes Anderson's movie, um, Moon, Moonrise Kingdom, which I, I absolutely loved. And he has a real um, way of, he doesn't really hide that, that he's altering the film. You know, it, his effects do not look photoreal. And that creates a, a kind of a, you know, it, it works in the, in the milieu of the, of the, of the film. It's, it's his style. And that's really cool. And to be able to do that, I think, you know, requires a lot of rest restraint and capability because you don't want it to look cheesy. It just needs to look a certain way. So, you know, there's that style of effect. Then there's the style that, you know, hyper real of scenes and things like that. The stuff as an editor that I try to do uh, is a little of both. Um, a perfect example is, you know, there are scenes in The Amazing Spider-Man where you won't see you won't notice any of the stuff I did where I may have, you know, used speed ramps to speed up somebody's performance, you know, so I don't have to cut away from them. They're taking long pauses and I want to, you know, tuck in that performance to, to get them to deliver their lines faster. There's a scene in the movie um, in a subway where we actually kind of go in. This person puts a, a beer bottle on another person's head and a little drop of dew rolls off, and, you know, splashes onto his forehead and it causes a, a, a reaction. Um, the way the scene was shot, it was just shot as a regular scene. You know, the guy puts a beer bottle in, it's sort of a medium wide shot. You know, it's about, about as tight as I am right now in this frame. And I thought, wow, you know, we want to make this scene kind of hyper real. We want to, we want to basically focus in on what, it, what the main character is feeling. So if you have an effects background and you're willing to kind of like play around, I was able to use one of my 3D tools, uh, Cinema 4D, mm -hmm. which I, I use on a regular basis for both post viz and just you know, goofing around having fun. I was able to actually generate a CG bottle and CG water and take the elements in the shot so that when the guy put the, the beer bottle on, I could cut in super tight, right, like really tight, and focus on that drop. 
and then go with a hyper real audio sound of the of the water rolling down the side of the bottle mm-hmm. in his place and start off the explosion that way. So that's one area where having the effects knowledge and the ability to use the tools actually benefited the movie because I was able to take it a little bit further. I was able to look at what was there and go, hey, maybe we can try this. And to be able to do it in a tenth version and have the studio and the director see it and like it and then show the VFX supervisor, you know, that's the type of collaboration I'm talking about. I think that there's room for hyper real stuff and completely invisible stuff in every movie. Certainly as an editor, I tended to gravitate more towards the invisible effects before I started doing the really, you know, interesting whiz bang, oh look at this, look at that, you know, sparkling lights and stuff. But um it's nice to have that knowledge in your tool set, and certainly one leads to the other. You know, they're not mutually exclusive. Mm-hmm. You know, the more you learn about the tools at your disposal and the faster you get at them, then the quicker you can realize these things and you can experiment. And, you know, everybody knows that editing, it's not just about, you know, um, making the choices and the decisions. Sometimes the mistakes really surprise you, and being able to just kind of do them as an exercise. I mean, I, you know, I do a lot of stuff. I would have to say that probably 60% of the ideas that I come up with, they never make it in the movie. And part of having this stuff and being able to do this is so that you can experiment. You know, you can't, you don't know if it's good until you see it. At least I don't. You know, it's very hard for me to look at something and go, hey, what if we did this? And then think it through in my head and go, yeah, that would be great. I, I need to see it. Ion Connection coming up on the next film. I know you've very been... Excited about it. Pardon me? I'm very excited about yeah. it. Yeah. And uh, you've definitely it. given us some very good input that is um, the wheels are turning and the code is being engineered. Uh, so there's some some of your um, comments earlier on Iron Connection, the online, the email ones through the beta right. program have been excellent. Multiple questions. How How is the beta testing going? And how do you see connection helping you on the next film and if you want to mention the next film go right ahead well my next movie is going to be on um, the hunger games uh catching fire uh, francis lawrence is the director mm-hmm. um it's a new group of people I've, I've worked with francis before i did uh water for elephants with him i'm very excited about it it's it's uh it's a character driven and an effects driven movie so there's going to be a you know I'm going to be doing a, an awful lot of temp effects. There's going to be a lot of, you know, comping, set extensions, and stuff like that. Obviously, uh, as the editor, I'm not going to be doing uh, very many final effects, but hopefully I'll be doing um, an awful lot of temp effects. And I plan on using um, Ion Connection through the whole process. Uh, because it integrates well with Avid, um, I'm hoping to have it running on my workstation, have it running on my assistant's workstation. Um, hopefully one of the VFX uh, editors, if, if they're not up to speed on Fusion, I'll get them up to speed on Fusion. Um, and I'd really like to have it sort of be a ubiquitous tool that we use on the show. Uh, I love the fact that, you know, I'll be able to throw the AVX plug in, the ion connection plug in into my timeline, hit a button, get on the phone, tell my assistant, hey, that's ready, get to work. Fusion's going to open up on their workstation. And they'll do the work if I don't want to do it myself. Because a lot of times there's stuff that's like, hey, I just want to do this or this, and then I'll keep editing and have it propagate to my timeline while I'm continuing. It's going to make things a lot smoother. Just the mere fact that I'll have the entire Fusion tool set at my disposal without a lot of bookkeeping, you know, housekeeping, getting stuff in and out of the system, it's going to be incredibly valuable to me. Um, it certainly was valuable when it wasn't there. Now I know it's going to save me even more time and just make it um, just faster and faster is better. Well, I think that probably covers a ton of interview. Um, is uh, If there's anything you want to add, we did certainly cover a lot of different areas. Obviously, I had a lot more questions that... But well, you, I mean, hopefully I've cross-pollinated across a lot of those questions. Yeah, I mean, I can really ramble. You know, I can... Yeah, no, we appreciate it. I enjoy talking about what I do. And, um, you know, I just want to say I'm really excited about the tools. I'm, I'm super excited. You know, I'm, you know, like I said, I've only been using Fusion really, you know, a lot in the past year. And I'm, you know, I can't wait to see where it's headed because I, I, I'm super excited about it. It's fast. It's intuitive. 
Works Beautiful. great. I love it. Well, six point four is around the corner, and, and I think you've already downloaded that, probably. Yeah, right I have it on on my laptop. Yeah. Actually. So the uh, new replicate tools are there. So that's pretty cool stuff. Yeah. Anyway, I want to thank you very much for the time you've spent with us today. Really, really appreciate it.